AM Weekly starting right now. Bringing emergency managers from around the world together to learn, share and collaborate. Well, that was a different introduction, but that's great. <laughs> good, morning. good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, excited to have uh, Jeff here with us today. Uh, and he wrote the book, Rethinking Readiness. And so we're going to really get into this. So this is Todd DeVoe, the host of uh, Ian Weekly. Today I have uh, my co-host, Dan Scott. And we are excited to be here, sponsored by Titan HST uh, for your communication needs. Titan HST is a great company uh, putting together some really interesting uh, products, including uh, COVID track tracing, uh, telemedication or telemed services, um, and more. So if you are interested or need any services, please reach out to titanhst.com. Let them know that you heard them here on EM Weekly. Jeff, welcome to the EM Weekly Show. Hey, great to, great to be here. Great to be back. And uh, first time on the live format. So uh, I hope you have me on a seven-second delay. I don't always watch my mouth. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll be good. Oh, man. I tell you, going doing live is a lot different than than doing the recording. But uh, I think it's a lot of fun. It's a little interaction, and it's always sure. good to have. It's always good to talk to you. So, yeah. um, Jeff. So, you know, today or this week, I should say, is the kickoff of National Preparedness Month, and we're having you on today because think, rethinking readiness. And one of the things that I'm stressing, I know Dan's kind of on the same page with me on this, is that we, as not only just uh, the nation, but as emergency managers, we need to move from the idea of the lights and sirens, the response mode, to really get into the preparedness mode and to the readiness mode and to resiliency. And I think that your book, um, and I was really actually humbled to be asked to be to read it before it was uh, uh, put out there, before it was published, and, and do a little review on it. But I think your book really kind of embellish, you know, emboldens that idea of what it should be to be rethinking readiness. Um, what got you thinking about this book, and 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 why did you decide to write it? Yeah. So the, you know, after, you know, um, X number of years of kind of working in the space on public health preparedness and, and with agencies and then in sort of quasi academic than actual academic environments, you know, we get to see a lot of different perspectives. I get to interact with a lot of just incredible people from all walks of life, from communities and in rural areas in North Carolina, all the way up to, you know, meetings in the White House and DC and elsewhere. Um, but what really got this book started was a conversation with my colleague and mentor, Dr. Erwin Redliner, um, who is the founder of the, the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had this notion that there were these kind of five scenarios that were very emblematic of what we were facing in the 21st century. And he and I talked a bit and he graciously allowed me to kind of run with that and, and develop the book. And, um, you know, what we really found and what I was sort of discovering and looking at these scenarios, uh, uh, bio threats, climate change, uh, infrastructure failure, um, cyber threats and uh, nuclear conflict, was that these were all threats that um, and vulnerabilities where human development, human activity was driving both the threat and the underlying vulnerability. So we could have talked about an asteroid hitting Earth and things like that. And it's not to say if it's not in the book, don't prepare for it. There's plenty <laughs> that's not in the book. Uh, but uh, but because of that, these were things that our activity, who we, what we're doing as humans is driving us more and more towards these mega disasters. But at the same time, it's also within our power to mitigate that and to reverse the course of that. So, so while it can be very depressing and frightening to read through all these scenarios, at the same time, I hope that it also is somewhat empowering that these are things that we are not powerless in the face of, but we do have it within our ability to uh, to reverse this trajectory. Absolutely. Speak of meteors, I guess we have one heading our way right now, right? Yeah, like an airplane-sized one and a near miss. I think I read something about that. <laughs> it's 2020. <laughs> so, going back to the, the the idea here of readiness, and 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 sometimes, and just kind of go back a little bit here, a little bit. Sometimes we make fun of and i say we the, the the collective we society i mean we even did a tv show called doomsday preppers right i mean we make kind of make fun of the people that have that preparedness mindset i mean heck if you go back to the bible people were making fun of noah right of being prepared for the flood so you know what why is it that people think preparedness is funny or silly or, or not something we should be doing 
You know, there, there's sort of like a whole range of things and, you know, far be it for me to tell someone sort of, you know, what they need to do to keep their family safe. But I think that, you know, in the face of these overwhelming threats, you know, whether it's uh, a COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, uh, you know, there are, these are very, very overwhelming. And unless we have the proper lens to understand these things, and unless we, um, you know, really, take a hard look at, at what are the controls that we can put in place? How can we adapt to these changes? It can be very scary and very overwhelming. And I think what you'll see is people will either in one extreme dismiss it entirely or say there's no point. And on the other extreme, really go in head first and you know, doing the whole doomsday prepper and building a show <laughs> around that. Um, and it's all just you know trying to, you know at the end of the day, it's people trying to process this information within the context of everything else going on. Um, and if they're not able to process it or are processing it in ways that may be more harmful or less beneficial, then I think that that's on on us and the the academic community and the response community and elsewhere to uh, continue to understand why that is and provide better frameworks and better ways of, of uh, approaching this information. So ultimately, as we said, you know, it's it's, it's hard for an uh, individual to wrap their head about, around um, something large scale like happening, uh, like the 40 days, 40 night flood or the coronavirus that's taken over the world. So how do we how, or how would you suggest that we start the, the small steps to change the mindset of those to prepare for readiness and mitigate against these uh, types of crises that are going to present? And it's, you know, COVID is not the last crisis we're going to present as a, as a right. uh, culture, as, as ultimately as, as a nation or a world. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, a great point and a, an important one and an important question, because I, I think that that's ultimately at the crux of it, right? We're good at talking about very big things with confidence intervals, right? How many trillions of dollars is the pandemic causing? But the, the decisions that, that parents are, are faced with right now is, should my kid go back to school? Um, it's things that, that companies are invested in is, am I going to be able to make payroll um, mm -hmm. for the next few months? And so these kinds of transactions drive our decision making every day, whether we're individuals, whether we're family members, whether we're legislators doing the calculations on reelection. And I talk about this a little bit in the book on how we need to really rewire these incentive structures. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I remember when the National Building Institute or an Institute of Building but that FEMA number, the $1 save six in, in recovery and mitigation, right? It was great. Finally, we had a number, right? $1 save six, one times six. <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, that's good to demonstrate that there is a return on investment. And that was a very important moment. But it was really about a very specific program, a very specific type of mitigation. It was a very specific analysis. If you're a day trader on the New York Stock Exchange, if you're a parent who has to pick the kid up from soccer, is worried about making a mortgage payment, doesn't have sick leave, is on an hour, you know, all of these things, that number doesn't mean that much to you. How do you integrate it into the transactions that you engage in every day? And so I think with, with all of these disasters occurring, um, we also need to know, we, we understand the larger trends. How do we make it relevant within the decision making? Um, and also, I, I think force feeding a lot of information that's not relevant to those decision making processes can add more noise rather than signal, you know, to the uh, uh, to, to the actions and the behaviors that, that we want to change or, or steer more towards um, uh, uh, greater resilience in aggregate. Well, ultimately, too, what we see um, in, as far as the mitigation aspect and how we can spend one dollar now will save us six dollars then. But it's changed. Ultimately, how do we, I mean, approach it as as in as a nation, from yeah. our leadership and our government? Because ultimately, we respond to what we see. Yeah. So we see, a, we and we respond, and we spend all this money in response, and and then we start planning for recovery. But we don't want to spend the money up front because we can't see it. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of what we do as as me as a practitioner is what I hear all the time is that's never going to happen here. So yep. why are we doing? It? So how do we get them to spend that money up front in mitigation and preparedness versus all of it in the back end on response and recovery? And I'll actually take that a step further that there's some evidence um, that's cited in the book as well too um, from some political scientists looking at uh, voter behavior and preparedness versus recovery that actually vote by the amount of recovery funding that comes in, but has virtually no change based on the amount of preparedness money that comes in. Uh, as individuals, as voters, we like to say thank you for bringing in this recovery money or how come we didn't get more, I'm voting for the other person. Um, but what we don't say is why do we need all this money? Why, did, why were we so vulnerable to begin with? 
Um, and I think that does come into like reframing the problem that that disasters, that these are things that can happen, that the past is not prelude. We are seeing more intensity of the threats that we face and we're experiencing more vulnerability because of our development actions. Um, and, uh, and again, ultimately reframing that question. Proximity to a disaster um, does help to make people more aware of disasters. Uh, this is an extraordinarily important teachable moment right now. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're not seeing uh, that moment being utilize as much as it can by in terms of the framing by political leadership um, without getting too deep into any of that really the first job of political leadership is to frame mm -hmm. the disaster and if they frame it by downplaying it versus by recognizing it as uh, you know that that sets everything else up in motion but also you know i can't let academia off the hook the seat that i'm currently sitting in um because you know we're not doing uh we haven't done enough yet um not that there aren't people working really hard on this, to provide more hard evidence at that transactional level. Again, we're really good at trends and the general steering of the at, yeah, it saves, but how do you get that when you have to compete with things like a, a builder who's gonna get paid when the job is done, not if it floods 25 years from now, and they have a family they need to feed, and they have staff with families that they need to feed. Um, so there, there's a bit of empathy too that I think needs to be, be baked into these decision makings that we can do the math, but then we also need to factor in um, the context in which these choices are made. You know, talking about that, you know, you look at disaster economics, right? I mean, that's like a, we have a study of a disaster economics now, right? And we take a look at numbers, but do we ever factor in the, the, tangible costs of the human uh, condition with those disaster economics? Well, so that gets into a sort of a complicated set. There's a growing body of research showing that disaster recovery and disaster assistance programs actually widen inequalities rather than bring them together, that they tend to favor communities that are wealthier, that are wider than those of color, um, than those that are, are more disenfranchised. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I use that to sort of frame my answer to the question, which is that um, not really. And when we do, the people who have a voice tend to be the people who have a voice before the disaster occurs. And this is a really important question when we're talking about things like managed retreat, right? We're good at doing the math on, is it worth building the seawall around this or should we move it inland? But if this is a neighborhood, I, I'll give an example. Um, so there's a, a town in uh, North Carolina, Princeville, which is, uh, um, I believe it was, it's the first incorporated town from freed slaves after mm -hmm. the Civil War. An incredible history, historically very impoverished, historically, you know, all, all of, um, uh, you know, very um, challenged environment and also in a floodplain has been affected by flooding from Hurricanes Matthew, Hurricane Floyd, things like that. Um, so, you know, from a dollars and cents place, if you're looking at real estate values, it may not look that attractive as, some, as something to save, but from a historical, from a cultural, from an identity perspective, there's something there that doesn't lend itself to an easy dollar amount, but that is very much in, embedded into the, the, the soul of the community and, and of the, the, the state and of the nation. Um, these are really complicated questions and they deserve the depth of conversation and the time devoted to them to really play them out. And um, that's another investment. It may not be as directly dollars and cents, but it's, um, uh, and I, I worry that we're not having those conversations and that ultimately when decisions need to be made and when they're reactionary, they're as binary as possible because that's the situation we've painted ourselves into. Um, but we have an opportunity to have deeper conversations if we invest in them now. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I'm actually, my mindset is when we take a look at planning as, as emergency managers, that we, sh I shouldn't say we shouldn't be planning for those. We shouldn't necessarily be focusing on those that have the means to escape, right? We really need to be focused on the vulnerable populations where they are, because at the end of the day, that's the area, if you take a look, if you think about Katrina, the lower ninth ward still in disarray still has yeah. not recovered from that you know where the rest of the rest of new orleans and louisiana is doing pretty functionally well you drive through the lower ninth ward and you're still seeing scars from from katrina mm -hmm. so I, I absolutely agree with you on 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 that um you know and going again going back into rethinking disasters this is one of these books that i think as an emergency manager you really should pick up read and, and and really add that part of your toolbox because it's not it's not a fluff piece it's it's definitely academic um, and it's it's something that 
we need to do as emergency managers is to continue uh, learn and grow. Daniel is the uh, uh, is the host of EM Student, and he talks really yeah. well about the idea of continuously educating yourself as an emergency manager. And I think this is one of those books that uh, should be added to your uh, uh, to your library for sure. We're gonna we're gonna jump into a quick break before we do. Uh, just let you know that Jeff um, has actually uh, has a link that we'll put up here. Um, we'll share out where you can purchase the book and you can get a signed copy and you can also get a personalized signed copy direct Rick from Jeff. So Jeff, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it's 20 bucks for, uh, uh, for a, a paper back book. And it's, uh, it's definitely worth having number one in your, on your library. And number two, you get a signed copy from Jeff. So I think that's, uh, that's well worth it. So, Hey, by the way, everybody, we just picked up a, a new um, sponsor, a uh, new advertiser. If you can see this box right here, it's from the Outer Limit Supply. I've been using Outer Limit Supply for my first aid needs for a few years now. Um, and they are awesome um, when, uh, you know, the boxes are great, the, the tools are great, and it's designed by a paramedic firefighter who's active in the outdoor space you know you're not going to get the you know you when you buy those uh, kits a lot of times you get a lot of junk in them and in this case these do not have junk in them they're, they're really well designed and really put together and so i use outer limit supply for all my first aid needs have been for a while again i would never make anything that i didn't use and you know like I said, reach out to those guys over at OuterLimitsSupply.com uh, for your first aid needs. And I'm really excited to have them as part of the EM Weekly family. Their bags and packs offer the best organization for the user from the experience, such as the high visibility interior for the users. I'm telling you something, I love that orange inside the bag because I can find the things I need quickly. I love my VanQuest bag. Don't forget, they offer free shipping, 100-day return guarantee, and a lifetime warranty. And if you put an E in weekly, all caps, all one word, you get 10% off your total purchase. VanQuest.com. <laughs> hey, welcome back from that quick break. Oh, I also forgot to mention that Outer Limit Supply is also giving a 20% discount. Again, if you put Ian Weekly in the discount code box, you get that. So we have a couple of comments um, that, that came in uh, through the thing. And um, so Michael goes, he's a, I remember FEMA study on Ian practitioners and all those responses, including me. He goes, findings were that only about 15% actually took the first step for themselves. And around 8% took the additional steps to actually prepare themselves. I wonder what the response would be now. Do you uh, do you walk the walk? I walk the walk. I don't know, Jeff. Do you walk the walk? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and is it as ideal as it should be? I don't know, but the um, but but certainly, you know, I, I find that you know well, we go camping a lot too, so you usually sort of have a heads up, right? If you've got your camp supplies, we did a survey too a couple of years ago and have a tracking survey. Had done it over a number of years, seeing that uh, you know about more than half of People generally say they have a preparedness plan, but when you drill down further, it turns out that that's only about a third of people that have an adequate preparedness kit and preparedness plan. But it is worth mentioning, there's actually not an evidence base for having a preparedness kit or having a preparedness plan. There's some studies that I've seen hints of in the field right now, but this is conventional wisdom that having a preparedness kit helps you in a disaster. And believe me, it probably does. You know, as they say in academia, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. Um, <laughs> but but what goes in it? What is the best makeup of it? These are things that are, are really based on people's thoughts and opinions and sort of experiences, which I don't want to discount. Um, but our policy for so long has been based on something without an evidence base. And after, you know, 15, 20 <laughs> Tw almost 20 years now, post 9-11, in kind of this modern era of emergency management, um, that's quite a long time to not have that. Uh, there's also, I would say, increasing evidence of the um, how important social connections are and social ties. And folks who have followed Daniel Aldrich and others know that there's a lot of just great um, research there as well, too, suggesting that, you know, um, 
ha uh, neighbors helping neighbors, knowing your neighbors could be as valuable as having that preparedness kit. Um, so, so I do, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying throw out the first aid kit and the extra food and water. Um, and in fact, especially now with the uncertainty of the pandemic, I think folks, I bet that number is quite a bit higher. Um, but it's also, you know, these are, are practices based on folks who have been through this, which is good. Mm -hmm. Um, but for policy, for large evidence, for these recommendations, we're still lacking in some essential information that should be more available to guide these recommendations. And Jeff asked, shouldn't the social vulnerability index be taken into account when planning um, since these areas have less resources to recover themselves and will require more assistance? And puts, absolutely, I agree with that. But Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, so we actually started doing some work. A colleague of mine, Jonathan Surrey, put together some maps with publicly available data, including um, the Social Vulnerability Index. We did it during Hurricane Harvey because our director at the time, Erwin Redliner, was going on TV and had all these questions. How many uh, uh, children on food stamps were in the evacuation zones? How many? So really looking at social vulnerability. And in all the publicly available sit reps, we couldn't find anything, any of that information. And so our, my colleague, what Jonathan did was he, he built a map. He took publicly available data, including the SVI, and overlaid it on the evacuation areas. So you could draw polygons and get the information. Uh, we started sharing um, this more and more with uh, uh, just folks out there. It ended up being shared with FEMA's uh, National Business uh, Emergency Operations Center with a number of NGOs. And we've continued to do it. Um, it's not a funded project. It's something that Jonathan does when he can spare the time. But we did them for Florence, for Michael, for other other uh, places as well. But I think, uh, I think that there's some incredibly powerful data that exists out there um, that if that can fairly easily be integrated into the way we dashboard and the way we monitor and look at response. And to that point, exactly, I think it is important that there we don't know who's going to need help, but we know where is going to need help. And these areas that are more vulnerable are going to have a harder time um, uh, than other areas that um, are a little different on these these vulnerability indices. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, you're muted, buddy. Of course I'm muted. Um, so I'm, <laughs> so I, you know, I agree with what you're saying 100% on that, Jeff, but, but I, I have a question as far as, so we do the data and we, and we understand where, um, where these zones are and where these jurisdictions are and where they have vulnerabilities, but how do, when do we start putting the data that we collect and the knowledge that we know into action? Um, and, and that brings me to the question of equality versus equity. Um, everybody's capable of, 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 preparing and, and, and being able to receive uh, help when needed and from like say FEMA or the government. Or but when it comes to there's those who are more prepared, more able to do things um, versus those who are not, they're just not able to evacuate. They're right. not able to, um, you know, to put a fill their car up full of gas or have a vehicle to get out. So these are things, how do we, so how do we differentiate between the equality of what we're offering and the equity of what actually people are needing? And I think that's the ultimate question that needs to be integrated both in terms of policy and in terms of programs, right? So we can give everyone a check for $1,200 to cover lost income, uh, you know, for the pandemic. And for some people, that's a huge difference between being able to stay in their home and not, and others it's not. Um, one of the biggest concerns with schools closed for the pandemic is schools continuing the feeding programs because some kids rely on that to have three squares a day. Um, and so it's not as easy to go to that family and say, you need to have a week's worth of food um, as it is to have someone who is bringing their, you know, so, uh, so I think that that's absolutely true is that giving everyone the same thing is not putting everyone in the same position. And I would also say too, that, you know, disasters amplify these inequalities and they, um, so someone who has access to more resources is not as badly affected as someone who doesn't have access to these resources. Absolutely. So it, it, it needs to be baked first and foremost in the lens in which we see disasters, um, in which we see our response that we are going to spend more on some areas because they need it more. Um, that's not a popular opinion when you're legislating, you know, disaster <laughs> legislation or authorizing legislation for agencies. Um, it's a, it gets into a value proposition. 
Uh, I think we saw this recently in, in a bond issue that, that was passed, I believe it was in Houston, looking at some of the flood mitigation and a lot of the wealthier areas were mad to see that a lot of the money was going to some of the poorer areas, even though all of the data, all the science sort of points towards that's where the vulnerability is, um, that, that conflicted with some expectations of some of the residents. Um, again, these are, are not simple answers um, with these because they do sort of come up against um, values that in the abstract we agree with, but when it comes down to my money and my family and my interests, um, you know, then uh, the ideal uh, sometimes is on a collision course with the actual. Uh, but uh, we, we simply won't get there without it. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a clean answer on that other than sure. this goes back to investing the time in embracing the complexity of these challenges. I have a funny well, question. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. No, no. I was, I was going to say, you know, ultimately. So one of the one of the main questions that I, I keep bringing up, uh, and I'm having we're having discussion groups um, on this topic, is how do we bridge that gap between academics and practitioner? And yeah. a lot of it would be how do we educate the practitioner to a level that they understand the difference between equality, equity, and how they can aid in those who need it more. Um, when these situations happen. And as we, we talked about a little earlier, is having a ready, readiness kit at home. Well, if, what if home is not an option? Right. What if you have to leave your home um, and, and being able to prepare them for either situation? So, um, you know, ultimately we need to bring, and I, I, you know, I'm kind of, I know I'm preaching the choir here when I'm saying this is, is how do we, you know, bring in those, the education to the practitioner and then out to the public who needs to know it and actually do it. Um, so that's, Ultimately, yeah. the question I have is how do we uh, continue the, the steps of making it actionable? Uh, we do the research and we and we and we know what we need. We know we know because we we do the research and we live it. But how do we then make it actionable to those who are out in the community? I and I think it goes both ways as well too on, on our end in academia, working more closely and, and genuinely with the practitioner community and the communities themselves. Because I think you're absolutely right. The science sort of steers us in one direction, but that has to be folded into social dynamics, political processes, um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I'm coming from an Ivy League institution in New York City. I don't always walk in the room with the ground credibility <laughs> in uh, certain environments. Um, and, and if I start academic explaining how someone should do their job that they've been doing for 20 years. Um, so it, it's absolutely a shared responsibility here. And uh, a lot of the projects that we've been doing at our center and that I've done throughout my career, uh, maybe it's because I started um, working in local government and just know what always made me angry when academics or consultants came in the room has really framed how I how I engage. But I, I think that it's it's we have a lot of answers from the scientific side and the practitioners have a lot of answers on how things work. And somewhere in the middle, there's a, there's a solution. And, uh, you know, programs like this, uh, bridging those conversations, I think are so important in terms of fostering an environment that, um, again, embraces the complexity of the challenges we see. All right. So I'm going to have to put your, put your public health hat back on. Okay. okay. And it's kind of a multiple part question. All right. So one is, is like, when we as emergency managers are taking a look at the data that's out there specifically with COVID and we're trying to inform our stakeholders, so such as our city managers, our city councils, this, these type of things, we're looking at the data that's out there. And the city council obviously has the political bent to it where they have their constituents that don't want to wear masks, that want to get haircuts, that want to open up. They're looking to get back to life to normal. And we're telling them still, hey, pull back, pull back on the reins. Let's hold back here because we're still not out of this, out of this, uh, out of the woods yet. How do we bridge that compared to those that want normal life compared to this uh, of us saying, Hey, we still have some really dangerous times ahead of us. This is not over yet. Yeah. So this is, this is the question really everyone in the field is wrestling with right now, right? Whether in public health, emergency management, uh, it's a very uneven response. Um, I will say, too, that this also speaks to the importance of, of appropriate framing um, among elected officials, because they're the ones who are really um, have a tremendous amount of influence in terms of framing this conversation. And it's so divergent right now. It's creating some pretty fierce headwinds. Um, there's also some good behavioral uh, health science. There was an article in Nature recently and, and another one, um, I think it was in BMJ, uh, sort of doing a roundup of the behavioral health literature or excuse me, behavioral sciences literature. 
culture and looking at, you know, individualistic cultures tend to be less willing to make sacrifices for the greater good than others. So those dynamics are important to understand sort of what you're going into. Um, and uh, because all of these responses take place within an ecosystem of the politics, the people, the players. Um, the first thing I would say is that, you know, a lot of times the way we have emergency management structured currently is in, in an advisory role and uh, an execution role. And actually that advisory role is pretty muted. Um, that, you know, a lot of times emergency managers aren't empowered to be part of the conversation on development and on the kinds of things, and yet you own the consequences of those decisions. And uh, I, I feel very strongly that that actually needs to change. Now, should an emergency manager have the final say on an economic development decision? Probably not, but they should be able to weigh in and say, hey, this is the consequence. Um, but then along those lines, I think that that's where the data needs to better articulate what are the consequences. An elected official is making a calculation. It's probably a value proposition on how much freedom to compromise. But then there was this narrative going around for a long time and still to a certain extent that, um, you know, we can lock down the nation and tank the economy or we can open up and let the economy keep humming along. And that is the biggest like crock of BS that I've heard as a public health practitioner. And there's a lot of evidence uh, now coming out of Europe and coming down out of other areas that lower transmission means you have more options for opening up the economy. It means you have more options available to you. And this is another big theme in the book and a big theme for me personally is to move away from deterministic answers, mm -hmm. one plus one equals two, and get into framing uncertainty. We don't know what's gonna happen but we know if we can keep community transmission low, we can sit outside and eat and have restaurants open, right? We don't know exactly how well masks work and what that opens up, but as we see things and you see where it's being done well, policies being adjusted, right? You know, restaurants are working, but bars seem to be a place of transmission. Sorry guys, the, you know, uh, but, but that's, you know, adjusting to the data and embracing the uncertainty of the situation because all of the scenarios laid out in the book and everything that we face in this kind of ecosystem of actors is mired in uncertainty. But if we stop trying to come up with the precise answer and instead frame that uncertainty and develop options and sort of uh, and, and can understand um, the consequences within that context, I think we're much better prepared to uh, move into the future and move into this more uncertain environment with tools that are designed to operate within uncertainty. Absolutely. One last question this is kind of a, a a buzzword question. Sure. So re resiliency is seems to be a buzzword right now. And it's, I hate the fact that it's a buzzword because it's something I've been embracing for a long time. The idea of what resiliency is and, and what we, the, you know, how we use this and how we can really bounce back from these disasters. But what is resilience and resiliency to you and how in this context of readiness, can we use that um, approach? Yeah, you know, I use a lot of these buzzwords too because they're how it's being talked about. And I remember in the early days, post 9-11, we were tearing down silos and then we were engaging the whole community and now it's all about resilience. And to a certain extent, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I have this slide in this presentation I do. There are a couple of lit reviews and there are hundreds of definitions of resilience. And some of them talk about resilience as an inherent characteristic of something, some as a process measure, some as the ability to bounce back. I think I end up using Webster's definition from the dictionary of something. But I, so, so it's one of these squishy terms with fuzzy edges. In a few years, we'll get bored of it and change it. But I think the spirit of it is important, uh, which is that, you know, being able to bounce back, being able to, and ideally bounce back better. Like how long do we get knocked down by these disasters? How vulnerable are we to them? Um, and I think the spirit and intent to that, um, regardless of sort of the precise definition is really important because it does sort of accept that, you know, there are um, disasters on the horizon. Um, one little critique I would give too, though, is that, you know, resiliency, we sort of look internally with resilience when we are actually contributing to these threats as well. It's not just about how well do we bend in the wind, but it's we're also contributing to how windy it is, um, somewhat literally, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Anyway, um, but but so um, but that's really what it all comes down to. And when we talk about it, are we defining it for the household? Are we defining it for the organization? Are we defining it for the community? And I'd say yes to all of those. You know that that we all exist within a social ecosystem, a political ecosystem, and an actual ecosystem. Um, and you know, there's no single action 
that's going to get us to our goals in terms of building resilience. It's only through embracing the whole of it and how all these different factors interact with each other um, that, that we have a chance. Um, but that being said, there's more information available than ever before. I get to see firsthand every day how hard people are working in communities, in research, in government um, to, to realize that promise. And uh, despite uh, um, probably what I should think, I'm actually quite optimistic at our chances. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I was remiss to not give you a proper introduction because I have you on the show a couple of times and I, we get to, as a, as a friend of the show, we know you well, but Jeff is the director of national, um, is the national center for disaster preparedness and readiness. I'm at Columbia University's Institute, earth Institute. And he just recently was promoted. So congratulations on, Thank the, you. Thank on you. the promotion. That's, I know it's hard work that you've been doing there and he's a bunch of good stuff that they're, they're putting out from there. Um, and realistically get his book. Right, rethinking readiness. And if you go, we'll put we'll put this link up. Um, we'll we'll get this out to everybody. Um, you can go to the the website that we're gonna put up there. It's the Riverbed Bookshop, and you can get there it is, and you can get a signed copy. You get a signed copy of the book. There it is. Okay. Uh, and again, thank you so much for allowing me to to read it before you you put it out to the to the public. It was a, it was an honor to do so, and and it was a great book, and it's a, and I I highly recommend it. And uh, yeah, get your copy today, by the way, everybody. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Todd and uh, and Dan, for, for the opportunity to be part of the conversation. And really, uh, your feedback and, and praise for the book really means a lot. So I, I appreciate all that you guys do as well, too, because, you know, as I mentioned, these conversations um, are really at the center of this. These podcasts, they allow us the breathing room to actually get into the complexity of these issues. And so it's, it's really an important part of how we're getting through this. So thank you, guys. Absolutely. It's great to talk to you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Daniel, uh, producer uh, so Brian back there somewhere, if you can pop in there. And I just want everybody, don't forget, look at, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, all those other social media places, and, of course, your favorite podcast player. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys next week. And happy National Preparedness Month. And as always, stay safe and stay hydrated.